Yes, Zoheb, there is no voice. Uh, just last two, three minutes. And then after that, we will start in the after three minutes. Yeah, we just uh, call the people. Hopefully soon they will be coming. Then we will take it forward. Yeah, I've got the questions now. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm covering the vast majority of those, I think. <laughs> okay, yeah, because I, I thought uh, what I wrote you in the morning is that maybe some of them are out of scope because people have asked about advanced risk based audit, which is uh, good that it is our upcoming session as well. Yeah, but exactly. But we'll, that's right. That, we'll mention those as well. That's good. Okay. Got a few more minutes, haven't we? A few more minutes, yeah. OK. Um, it's 10 a.m. I will formally start the session now. Good morning, everyone. And this is Kazi from Symphotex Training. I have with me, uh, And uh, I have I have a in a meeting. I have a meeting. I have a meeting. I have a meeting. I have a meeting. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, hello. Mike. Oh, thank you. So uh, we have this one hour session and uh, the topic for today is um, audit analytics, which is one of the most uh, needed topic from the audit professionals. Uh, before I start the program, I would like to thank you uh, all of you for this morning and especially our partner Osman Yusuf. Uh, he is uh, running a CIA aspirants global team and he has partnered with us uh, in this program. Thanks a lot, Philip. I think I believe it's 7 a.m. in uh, UK and you are up early morning for this program. So I won't take much time. Uh, you can ask questions in between uh, whenever Philip has some pause during the presentation, then you can post a question on the chat window and we will be having a formal question and answer session for 10 to 15 minutes toward the end of the session. So next one hour is yours. Uh, thank you, Philip, and let's start. Thank you very much. I will just share my screen. There we go. You probably all see that now. OK, I'll just introduce myself <clears throat> and then I will uh, deliver session. Um, I think it's because they said then if there's any questions you want to ask, just post something in chat and then we can pick them up and then we'll have the session at the end. Just to introduce myself, you can see pretty much what we do by the name of the organization. Um, I work in this field of risk and assurance and have done through most of my career. I trained as a chartered accountant. <clears throat> I uh, moved into in, into industry after that. I've worked in different sectors, different industries. I originally went into internal audit. Uh, I've done lots of other things. I've managed IT. I've been responsible for procurement, finance, but I kept coming back to uh, internal audit because I never found anything that gave me the breadth that internal audit did. Um, so I have worked in different sectors. I've worked in finance. I've worked in government. I've worked in construction and a couple of times in retail. My last organization, I was, I was head of uh, uh, internal audit and risk management. I've headed four internal audit functions during my career. The last one was an organization with two and a half million employees. 
we had 8,000 locations and I had a team of 350 in my team. Quite a big operation. Uh, it's a retail organization called Walmart based out of the US. You may well have heard the name. They sort of quite a global player. Since then, I set up the company and I've been delivering training and consultancy uh, to organizations all across the world um, in the fields of internal audit, risk management, corporate governance, uh, fraud, um, and similar areas. So I'll, that's a little about myself, um, and I will now set off and uh, deliver this webinar for you. Um, audit analytics is very definitely uh, a hugely important topic. Um, it's the only way to audit in real depth. Um, you can do a lot of um, work in, in internal audit, but uh, if you only do sampling, that's quite difficult because the trouble is with a sample, how do you know it's a representative sample? Whereby the big advantage of, of data and analytics is you can actually potentially look at the whole population and you can look um, across that. Uh, and the big advantage it gives you is it also gives you a high level of assurance. Because if you go at the end of an audit and say, OK, uh, what have you covered? And you said, oh, we've, we've done samples of 100 uh, transactions in this area and they say what out of 250,000 now okay you can argue that yes it's statistically significant but it isn't to them and I think the big problem we have here is that uh, what we've got to try and do is reassure management that uh, uh, essentially we have good given good coverage so they can get the confidence from that so data analytics is not new. It's been around for many, many years. I think the first time I used it would probably be 30 years ago. It has changed a lot since then, um, and it has become a lot easier to use. Um, when I first used it, you had to know everything about the field layouts and everything. You don't have to do that now. Obviously, now, now, now using Windows and similar products makes it a really easy tool to use. A little bit of training needed, but not difficult. So there is big advantages of using data analytics. This actually comes from a, a, a report done by the Institute of Internal Auditors, um, and it highlights three errors. The planning stages, how you carry out an audit, and then the reporting, and how data analytics can help. First of all, risk profiling. Now, obviously, um, as you know, you have to make assessments of the uh, effectiveness of the risk maturity on each uh, area before you go and audit it. Um, very useful with analytics to get a picture of the wider perspective and the population. Then, of course, this enables you to do um, better testing. Statistical sampling is then sort of largely replaced by looking at population reviews. If you go at the end and say, We've actually looked at this whole population over the last six, six months. You get a very different reaction from them. Obviously, the actual process itself has got a number of elements to it. Uh, we can actually in, uh, incorporate something they call now continuous audit or continuous monitoring, which actually could just be real time. We do it as it happens. We'll talk about that as we go through. It's a very powerful technique um, to enable fraud indicators to be highlighted and indeed fraud detection. Um, and we used it a great deal for these particular aspects. And I'll show you some of the uh, techniques as we go through. Um, and you can also put in specific situation scenarios, which they call control simulation. So in other words, to say, let's have a look at this and then let's have a look what's actually happening. And then obviously the reporting, this will gives you a much better opportunity to highlight the issues. You can quantify the the issue, the risk rather better. You can create a process where my, you're almost a developer. Then you can pass it over to management so they can do it. And we can even use this in, in root cause analysis. So it's quite a powerful tool. I'm only going to give you a flavor for this in the, the time we have available. Let's just have a look. This is my survey it was done about uh, 18 months ago, um, and they were asking about the use of audit analytics. As you see, it varies a little bit depending where you are across the world. Um, interesting, it's nice to see that um, the Asia Pacific region is sort of leading in this particular area. Um, 
so but I, I, but as you can see it, it clearly says that we've got 76 percent who are utilizing data analytics question is how much is it being utilized um, as you see the statistic at the bottom 22 percent have got it but have no defined strategy for how it's used and when i work with internal audit functions i tend to ask them uh, do you have it oh yes we do do you use it on every audit oh no no just some of them now my question is why people say well it would only really use it to analyze financial debt no you don't you know you can certainly you can do alpha matching as well it's too restricted to looking at financial activities that's for sure um have a look at the bit on the right though it says rate the quality of the data available now much less now of course you are reliant on the information um provided internal audit used to have to go to it and say oh we need access to these nowadays that's given automatically obviously access will only be um, on a read only basis you know you, you are you not going to be wanting to take any risk with the live data obviously um but again it's only as good as the information that's there but also it enables you through this process to question challenge the information which is not just the one that's passed to you but also passed to management for decision so as i say if you, if you can use the software and, and actually analyze gaps and processes where maybe it isn't good enough for senior management you can actually demonstrate how you can deal with it so this isn't a very very powerful set of of mechanisms tools so the first thing you've got to do when you use the analytics process is identify fruitful areas now obviously you know there's uh, you obviously you've got to have the information electronically to be able to do it the good news it doesn't matter which system it sits on um, one of the big problems sometimes with the the big systems in in uh, in organizations sometimes they don't talk to each other and the difficulty with that is how do you actually get the comparisons well with these with these analytics tools and there are quite a number out there on, on the market the 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 most use tools are ones called ACL and IDEA, but there are plenty of others out there. Um, and uh, so this really coming up as well now to uh, fill some of the gaps. Um, if you use if you use those tools, um, then you are in a much better position to be able to sort of demonstrate that we can actually compare information from this system to this system and do it through essentially your computer. All you need to do is get a copy of each of those two f systems, those two files, and then you can do any comparisons you want. And this doesn't necessarily also restrict you from necessarily having to do it just within one activity, one process. This crosses the organization. So first of all, you have to develop a process, a mechanism. What types of comparisons do we want to do? And to, to do so, you might need to be aware of the system and information flows, which you do anyway as an audit team, don't you? Then what you might need to do is compare, uh, prepare control profiles. So in other words, what would be the um, acceptable process? What would be the close we would expect? Which could be the areas where there could be gaps? What we're trying to do is, first of all, build the knowledge, build the appreciation. You may be also to be able to go and get external databases. Um, this is uh, uh, useful information sometimes. So that could be, uh, PO, PO box numbers, you know, and because sometimes these not you may be using ones that aren't valid. Well, that's a very good thing to try and identify, particularly from a fraud point of view. Um, and there's quite a lot of information that that's held, and so like accommodation addresses, you know, where people use a different address than they have. Once you've got all the information, then then you can conduct the tests and review the results. We'll have a look at the process itself in a moment. Sometimes this analytics is called data mining. Now, almost like mining for, for, for materials, um, you're mining for data. So there's a number of different ways this can be done. And some of these are incredibly sophisticated. Most organizations use these techniques without really realizing they do so. As an example, um, neural networks is the ultimate of this, almost like a brain, how our brain works all the little linkages within our brain and how that actually works together. Um, the, the credit card companies, for example, 
um, will use these tools. They don't necessarily know that it's actually analytics, but that's what they do. They can analyze every transaction on every credit card. And what they're looking for is identifying the unusual patterns so they can identify somebody is trying to sort of get in to that particular person's account you know, uh, fraudulently. Um, so we, and there's something on here. I mean, data visualization is seeing where the information is, where it is held and knowing, you know, uh, who has access to it. Uh, you can use trend reports. Now, trends, of course, are trying to look at patterns, sometimes called pattern recognition. Uh, would what would be an unusual pattern within this information? Um, and the big advantage that these products have is something called fuzzy logic. Now, this means that um, this these tools can identify near matches. Now, that's very unusual because most IT systems, even the big IT systems, can only identify things where it's exactly the same. Let me show you what I mean by that. So here's a fuzzy logic example. So imagine that we have two transactions um, and you see the two at the top. The one is different. That's just got a comma in there, hasn't it? Now, in an IT system, that would not be spotted as the same transaction because IT will say, no, no, that's different because it's got a comma. Now, we could spot that, but IT can't really do that. But these tools, these analytic tools can do so because that would be regarded as a very close or near match. So this is a reason why sometimes duplicate payments and things get through the system, because people just sometimes make an error and say put a dash or a gap or a dot something in it, then the IT system will pay nothing like and pay them both. Now, auditors are very in a very good position to try and identify those issues. So as it says here, uh, the existing transaction with the same number would be an unexpected pattern, but are they the same? This is fuzzy matching. So I think it's a sort of, this is an enormous benefit that um, you can't really do this in any other way other than just being fortunate and come across it within the audit, which is very unlikely to be honest. Another way of looking, I'm just showing you uh, some of these techniques because we're going back here to sort of pattern recognition is the next one. So here's an example. You know, if you were trying to look at unusual patterns where you've got rounded up numbers, in other words, you've got round sums. So how many times do we have the sum of 5,000, you know, in this particular one or 25,000 or a million or whatever it is? Um, and those were not easy to find because they're, you know, they're in very different parts, they're different dates and so on. But ACL and IDEA have a function called MOD, M-O-D, can identify the patterns in the numbers. So in other words, you can say, we want to identify transactions that are a, a whole multiple of 100, 1,000 or whatever. And you go, well, within this period, why have we got um, 72 transactions Um, for 28,000 or 568,000. Um, that's quite unusual, isn't it? Keze, can you deal with that one? I don't know what's happening there. Uh, yes, I'll say it again. Yeah, it says on my, on the top of my screen here that uh, somebody is... Uh, <laughs> requiring control good thank you okay so the other thing you do we mentioned briefly use of static profiles so yes you can get this information sort of po box numbers because quite often organizations have a po box number how do you know it's actually a valid number again there are records of those and you can then run that and put those into these tools to be able to do it telephone analysis is another very interesting thing you can do looking at because all calls you know, have some sort of record. There is a record of calls made. This is particularly useful in an investigation type situation where you want to try and find who's calling who. This isn't something normally would be done, but periodically it could be very useful. We used to look for things like collusive relationships. So this could be pure uh, errors. We used to look for situations where we're to say, OK, um, how many times have we got this same supplier on the file? And sometimes it could be maybe the names are in different sequence. 
so we say, you know, it's got three names. The first time is a for one, two, three. Next one is three, two, one. So again, these tools can identify those matches. So any combination of those three names, and then you suddenly find we've got the same supplier six times. And we go, why are we actually dealing with them in six different ways? Why are we just having one account for them? Because <clears throat> you may be losing out on that. They may be, you know, not giving you the discounts because they're, and they just wonder why you want to have six of these. Maybe it's been set out by somebody separately. Um, looking at, we used to look for comprises of names, employees and suppliers. You would not really expect to have the same name, would you? But it, it's, we're looking for these unusual things here. Uh, suppliers with other suppliers. We used to sort of uh, know who the parent company was, and then it's allowed us to say, OK, these are all the names. Have we got any of these names uh, on this? Because obviously we shouldn't be. And we found situations where we were putting, there were bids coming in from three different organisations, but they're actually all owned by the same parent company. And nobody seemed to know that. I mean, is that acceptable in the bidding process? So there's quite a lot of things you can look at here. Uh, front companies. These are sometimes organizations who are, you know, they, they don't trade, but they have this sort of a, a name. And you go, so why are we dealing with them? Why are we dealing with the, the others? Matches between addresses, banking information, family. We used to look, for example, at um, why have these five suppliers got the same address? You know, it's not it's not impossible. They could be, you know, within the same location, but in the same absolute address, very unusual. So what we're trying to do here is identify the patterns, the unusual elements, the things that would we'd say that's worth having a look at in more detail. That's what we're trying to do with these. Let's just have a look at, at some possible examples. This is a little small on the screen, um, uh, <coughs> but um, you can look at compliance issues. <clears throat> so these are just examples of data analytics. Expense reports, looking at that, who's claiming, why, why, be, why is this particular person claiming so much more than the other people? Or let's have a look at the patterns. Um, why is these, why is it so huge amount of charges here and it isn't here? Again, we can look at supplier audits. I'll give you some examples of those. There's nothing really you can't look at here, providing you've got the information electronically. As I say, it doesn't matter where it sits. Um, obviously, <coughs> you can look at regulatory issues on here. If we've got new regulation, making sure that that's um, known, being applied, because you can see it through in the data in terms of the references to it, etc. Very, very useful fraud risk assessment. Um, we used to look for things like ghost employees, false suppliers, um, unusual factors that we'd be, be in here. Um, and of course, you can then look at the, the wider issues of operational performance as well, as it mentions down the bottom here. Um, I will provide a copy of these slides through to because they're there and you know, you will be able to get a copy of these afterwards. And I'm just going to pick one topic area just to demonstrate to you the potential. This is just accounts payable. Now, you know, there's you can apply these techniques to all aspects of the business. This is just one of them. I'm just trying to show you how many things just in one area you could look at um, using analytics. So this is accounts payable. Bear in mind, you can do this in any activity. So we used to look for invoices without a purchase order number. Now, why don't they have a purchase order number? I thought it was a requirement that people had to um, had to quote. Oh, yes, but these are not areas where we've got a purchase order. Why do we not have a purchase order? Why are we not insisting on a purchase order? So this very much allows you to see what's happening. Multiple invoices with the same item description. Now, that is interesting, isn't it? Because it depends, of course, the information you capture. Presumably we do because we're actually buying items, you know, we're buying inventory and so on. So we could have a look at those issues and go, hang on, or invoices with no description. Why doesn't it tell us what we're getting? Duplicate invoice numbers, very, very powerful. This one, um, why have we actually got the same invoice number? Oh, well, it's not quite the same invoice number because it's got a dot in it. So we accept both because the system will accept them. Now, you know, have we built in a situation within the controls that you will not accept the same invoice number twice. Is that really in that? Most systems don't necessarily have that in there. 
So what this almost allows you to do from an audit point of view is not just highlight the issues, but then demonstrate to management why it is a control issue and a control failure. Multiple invoices for the same amount on the same date. Well, how can they be? Um, uh, invoice payments issued on non-business days. That's very interesting, isn't it? Why are we paying uh, on a Sunday when we don't work on a Sunday? How is that happening? What's occurring there? Is that feasible? Uh, multiple invoices at or just under the approval level. That's a very, very common one. So, you know, for example, if people have an authority level of 100,000, what are the ones underneath that? We used to look for the ones between 95,000, you know, and 99,000, whatever, um, because maybe they're using that to avoid having to go for the next level of approval. Um, or indeed, as I mentioned earlier, having invoice amounts that are the same, because we found circumstances where people said, OK, well, I've got 100,000. We've put in this transaction through and it's 150,000. So let's put two transactions at 75,000. Then we don't have to go for the next level. And when you tend to do it, they tend to put two equal amounts. So it's easy to spot. And obviously these tools can spot those issues. I say I'm only picking one topic here. This is, you know, you can do this for any activity. Here's more on accounts payable. Vendors who use a post office box number for an address. That's not invalid, but again, you want to have a look at that and, and make sure that's OK. Price increases greater than acceptable percentages. So you would say we expect the prices as, you know, overall for these items should have maybe gone up 10, 15 percent. Why is this one going up 100 percent? Why are we suddenly paying more? We used to look for circumstances where we looked at, um, for specific items and said, well, hang on, what, how, how, how is this increasing in price that much? Uh, continued purchases in spite of high rates of return, rejections or credits, because presumably that means we're, we're not happy with this supplier because we're getting a lot of problems. So why are we continue buying from them? Very high levels of purchases from one vendor. Um, you know, we're suddenly giving them a huge amount more business. Why are we? Payments to vendors with the same names, addresses, phone numbers as employees. OK, so that's, I've just picked one topic there and it's just the only thing that holds you back here really is your imagination for the types of comparisons you want to do. Um, all of these are very difficult to do just to come across them looking at the process. This way, this brings it out. Let me just give you another example. This is another way this can, uh, this can be done. Assessing prices paid for a product. So what you can do within these tools is do a ratio analysis. Ratios are very valuable within these tools. What would be an, a normal ratio? So here, for example, we're trying to find out how much we're paying for a particular product. And then obviously we can run the issues through through the database and find out the issues. So in this particular example, first product, we got a huge ratio. Second one, very small ratio. So that would say the, the amount we're paying for the second one is probably about right. Why on earth are we paying almost double from different suppliers? So this may be different suppliers, you see. So we're trying to find out. So the question is, why are we, why are we suddenly paying double from that for this same item? Oh, we've gone for a different supplier. Well, why are we doing that? You know, is that known? Is it appreciated? Why is that happening? This leads you to lots of questions and lots of investigation and questioning you can do. So these tools have lots of capability within them. And as I say, the only thing that really stops you is sometimes appreciating all these options that appear um, when you go along and use them. I think this is why as I said earlier, that most people say we haven't used these tools on every audit. And I would say, why on earth not? Well, we were, we probably don't know enough about it to see how we could. Well, learn is the best thing to do. As I say, the only restriction, you know, is your imagination. I mean, here's just a, a couple of other examples. Looking at overtime payments compared to all other employees in the same job classification. So again, why is these two people get lots of overtime, these people are not getting any? Um, testing general ledger account balances, where it's significantly different from last year. 
Why has it gone up significantly? So the, as I say, the uses of this are almost unlimited. Providing you've got the data, providing it's good, you've got electronically, it doesn't matter where it sits. You can do any comparison you want. Um, this is one technique which you may not be aware of, but it is built in um, to the, the tools themselves. Um, Benford's Law is a hugely powerful tool which not many people know about, and it's really about how numbers occur. And he was a mathematician and he produced a paper in the late 30s. It then, I think he passed away and it didn't get picked up until a bit later. But um, he found it by looking through log tables. You remember logarithms? You need to be an age to, to, to remember logarithms. But they came in a book and he found that certain pages were used more than others. And it got him thinking about it. And we live in an extremely ordered world. So you can actually predict um, how numbers will occur. Um, this is a bit strange. So in other words, we're not looking at the monetary values. We'll look at the numbers involved. It's called the first digit law. And it's a fantastic tool and apply to any randomly generated data. So, for example, if you want to predict, um, let's say, with purchase order amounts, um, how many will start with number one, number two, etc., you can predict it. This is incredibly accurate. Um, let me just show you. So Benford's law says there is a 30.6% chance the first number will be a one. Only a 4.7% chance it'll be a nine. Now, so that means one could be 10, 100, a million, 10 million, starting with that number. This is not, you see, this is quite amazing, isn't it? It works on the, the second and third digit as well, but not quite as dramatic. So, you know, if we're looking at purchase invoice amounts, let's say, um, we're trying to understand what spread we would expect. So if you want to say how many of this population of 150,000 transactions will start 100, then it's 30.6% multiplied 12% multiplied by 10.2%. So you can predict how many will begin with that number. Obviously, 999 is, is the least. Now, it sounds, sounds incredible, doesn't it? It's used very, very powerfully within data analytics, and it's built in. Um, and, it, it, you know, it will say how many leading digits do you want to use? Then you get an analysis to say, um, and usually it produces it in a diagrammatic form and says, OK, we expected there would be uh, 300 transactions that, that were, were number 568. There were actually, there were 1,000. You want to go and look at that as something unusual in the data. Um, it's, this is a dramatically powerful tool that most people know very little about. Uh, we used to use it a great deal. You can only use it where it is, where the... You know, they, they, they could be any amount or could be any numbers. So we're not looking at the values. We we'll look at the numbers themselves. You can read a lot more about this if you wish to. Um, it's an enormously powerful one, particularly in fraud investigation. Uh, we found uh, I, I've investigated hundreds and hundreds of, of frauds in my time, and uh, the majority of them we found using this tool because the fraudster doesn't know anything about this tool and will put transactions through that do not fall, follow into the patterns here. This is so there's a, a huge amount to get at and learn on these. Obviously, all of these topics we go to develop in the forthcoming training courses on future internal audit and advanced risk based audit and so on. So I'll talk more about that a little later. But certainly, if you're not aware of Benford's law, you haven't seen it before, then it's very, very useful to find out more about this one. Here's a little example of the use of Benford's law. Auditors were investigating fraud in the contracting section, where thousands of contracts were raised every month. They used Benford's law to examine the first two digits of the contract amount. And they found that digits 4-9 were in the data more often than expected because they knew, you know, using these tools, how many you expect. So they would expect 4.9 would be 9.4% times 
an 8.5 percent from that area but they got significantly more than that so the question that they less said why are we actually doing that so they could now go and look at that and find out why the first digits four nine were more than expected and they found that um the first two digits were because we're in the 49,000 to 49,999 and they were done to avoid the contracting regulations So, because they found contracts under 50,000 could be sold sourced, contracts greater than 50,000 had to be submitted to the bidding process. So they put them in just or underneath that, which of course was found by Benford's law because that's an unusual pattern because they didn't just do it once, they did it many times. Um, and obviously that came out. So the, these these tools are, are, you know, are there and they're quite amazing tools because they're incredibly accurate. I'm not sure how on earth this guy sort of came across this and how he did it, but, you know, there are some amazing situations. It's not actually a mathematical law now, but he's recognised it does work. It wasn't actually proven, this particular law, until this century. Isn't that amazing, that? So, it was, they knew it worked, but nobody actually knew how it worked at all. I would just say, go with it. You will find very, very interesting patterns in the data using this first, second, and third digit law, as they call it. Okay, so all I'm trying to do here is just give you a, a taster, if you like, for some of these issues and allows you going to look at things in more detail. The other thing you can also do is using these tools is unlike analyze big data now big data is getting a lot of discussion now uh, and big data essentially is can can you just um, mute yourself please yeah i put mute all so um phil you please unmute yourself Okay. okay, so I, thank you. Analyzing big data. I mean, it's a lot of discussion about this one, but there's a lot of information that's there, which is not necessarily financial data. So, you know, here we've got things like social media, links to social media. Who's monitoring that? You know, how is that captured in the organization? Emails. Very interesting. We used to look at deleted emails. People don't realize that emails are not actually deleted. They kept on the system for a while. Or what is the pattern in the emails? Now, this is huge amount of data, but these tools, these analytic tools, are a very, very good way of getting quickly through very big volumes of data. Third party vendors. We looked at situations. How many third party vendors have access to our system? What's actually, what access do they have? Um, and so on. You can actually monitor this through uh, through these tools and something we're going to come to just in a moment called continuous audit or continuous monitoring. Uh, market research, we can look at that. Surveillance cameras, you know, monitoring these areas. You know, these are captures, not just images. We've got records of these things. Um, and what's the patterns in that data? So, I, I think, it, you know, this is not restricted to just looking at financial data. And then, of course, you know, we we can actually monitor sometimes um, uh, assets that are tagged and so on and what's happening in the movements of us. You don't have to look at all of these, but, you know, the chances are there's a lot more information, you know, within your IT systems than is traditionally looked at from, from an audit point of view. But if you can understand the patterns and understand the comparisons you want to make, you're not held back. And nowadays, all that's required is that you are given um, access to the data. Normally, from an audit point of view, you would be given access, recognizing you're not going to share it with anybody else, etc. And obviously, you're only going to use um, a sort of copies of the data. Obviously, you're never ever going to be using the live data for obvious reasons. Too much of a risk. So if you want to extend the analytics process, we can move into continuous auditing. Now, this, I think, is probably the most exciting element, and most organizations have not moved this far yet, but it's coming through now. Rather than or auditing historically, why can't we audit things real time or as close to real time as we can get? 
Uh, and the reason behind this is to try and make sure that, you know, things that we come across are real, they're happening now. The trouble is, I think that historic auditing identifies things that were happening two months ago, three months ago. It's all very nice, but how do we know what's happening now today? Um, and historical sampling is very, very limited, isn't it, what we can do. What we're now saying is, why can't we really get right up to date? Now, we, you, what you can do with this is you can actually audit real time. So some organizations now are, are actually recognizing that internal audit could be the developer. So in, and that's what we used to do even a number of years ago by saying, look, these are the comparisons we've done. Uh, which identify a lot of issues. So we're going to suggest now that you put this comparison, this within to the into the system, so that this comparison is done all the time. So that means if this happens, you'll spot it straight away through continuous monitoring. And I think that becomes a very powerful linkage. And it means then internal audits are adding a lot more value because now you're putting in a process to ensure those issues can't happen again or they will be monitored. What continuous auditing now is doing is sometimes these audit tools, the likes of ACL IDEA and so on, and there's not many organizations using it yet. I know of probably 10 or 12, that's all, who are actually running the audit tool in the background, validating the live data. Now that's incredibly exciting, isn't it? So in other words, what he's saying is, this is the input, this is the exit output. Was that the output? If the answer was no, the live processing is stopped. Someone has to go and look at that and a report is given to internal audit. So in other words, it is known as these things happen. So you see what we're doing? We're, we're putting all these elements in, understanding how this should operate, you know, in the proper control environment and any situation it doesn't automatically the system highlights that and somebody has to go and investigate it. Now, obviously, if it's a one off situation, maybe audit don't need to do anything. But if it happens five times, you know, on the same in the same week, maybe there's a different circumstance. And this is where audit can get involved. So I think this is it's demonstrating how audit can you know be much much closer to the action so continuous auditing is very much ongoing assessment used by technology so we're moving away from this periodic one we come along every uh, you know every six months every 12 months these tools you can run in the background and run them as often as you want you don't have to use continuous audit for that you can just say okay uh, we've done these comparisons which highlighted something that we were you know uncomfortable with because there was control problems so once we set it up as a test you don't need to do it just when you do an audit you could run this test every month if you wanted to and then say what's coming out from this um okay there wasn't anything in month two and three suddenly in month four bang we've got some issues and it could be we found because as you're probably aware, if you make a recommendation and they implement it and they don't fully understand it, they do it and then a bit later they fall back to where they were because they didn't really understand it. And you can spot these things in that way as well. Um, so continuous auditing is, as I say, is quite new. Um, and again, you've got to try and ideally coordinate with the first and second lines of defense because again, you want to make sure that anything you do can be then taken forward and put into the live processing. Again, I'll let you have a look at this later on when you get the copies of these slides. Um, <clears throat> let's have a look. Um, obviously, it can be real time assessments. And again, <laughs> I rather like this. That'd be rather good, wouldn't it? Nine days a week. Clever if you can do it. I don't know whether, <laughs> but it almost it allows you to do more in the in you know in that week than you would ordinarily be able to do. Um, obviously, as it says, you can be the developer here of control evaluations and then pass the responsibility. But you can do more than that. You can actually sometimes even do comparisons <clears throat> across organizations. 
as an example of this one, in my country, two government departments uh, were trying to make sure that information was properly shared. So the internal audit teams got together and they developed a comparison between the data. <clears throat> These were two departments. One was the one responsible for work and pensions, and the other one was dealing with births, marriages and deaths. And they, they wondered whether, because there was a notification when somebody died through to the other department, they wanted to know, I wonder what if that, if that notification isn't made. That would mean then we'll continue paying somebody a pension who's dead. So they, they developed a test using these. So sharing the data between the two departments, this is really quite unusual. Um, and then they found there were quite a lot of people who were receiving a pension who were, who were dead because some of this information wasn't being passed. So what they did then, they developed from this a continuous process, monitoring process, so that um, as somebody passed away, there was an automatic notification and a verification of that as well. So that then was built in to the systems so that those two systems could talk together in this way. And as a result of that, it's not now possible for somebody who's passed away to be receiving a pension. So these are very, very, um, when you think about them, they're quite simple, but they're very, very powerful in terms of what can be achieved by them. And then we've got this, if you like, this continuous assurance. So this now is, becomes the combination of auditing and monitoring, which is after all what we're trying to look for. We're trying to give reassurance to management that these particular activities, these processes are managed well enough um, and we don't have any problems within it. So I think the uh, the applications are almost unlimited here, aren't they? But it just means you've got to sort of look in a different way. You've got to be uh, aware of these issues. Uh, I've mentioned the uh, the pension payments one here. Um, obviously, impact and output comparisons are enormously important. Um, but you can uh, you can develop these in and you know as much depth as you wish. There's a huge amount of uh, opportunity here to develop this. I'm going to, I don't know whether any of you have moved into this field yet. If you haven't, it's certainly what's going to move forward. I mean, and things like employee expenses. Now, obviously, this would not be an area that Audit would even look at, but we found um, when we were found somebody who was potentially committing fraud, they typically also did falsify their expenses. So we looked at patterns in the expenses and then we could put these in just so it ran all the time. So we could say, you know, in this particular role, you wouldn't expect somebody to be claiming more expenses than this amount because of the, but obviously the more senior, the more they will. So what happened here? Why does suddenly we have this change? Now, it didn't mean there was anything wrong necessarily, but it did mean it was an unusual pattern within the data. So all we're trying to look for here is uh, anything that will enable us to give a high level of assurance, a high level of confidence to management, but also um, identify areas where things could be happening that might be not as you expect. So what I've tried to do is just give you a very brief um, overview of, of, of that, just to give you a flavour for these issues. Um, and what I would want you to do, I've got a few more things to say, but I'd just like to, if if I might, just open it up at this stage to, to questions and people, you know, any questions you have, because I've covered that quite quickly, but there's a lot underneath this. So let me just give you a, uh, an opportunity, should you wish to, to, to ask any questions you wish at this point. Um, let me just see. Okay, so if you want to ask a question, just uh, you are uh, just don't need to unmute yourself to be able to do that. I did get a list of, of questions, but only got those this morning. So I think I've, I've covered quite a number of the ones you highlighted, but just let me know if there's any specific issues or questions that have come from what I've said or other issues you're thinking about within this whole analytics 
uh, framework. Hi, how are you? How are you? Hi, good. Uh, I just wanted to know, is there any check for like something which has happened in between the, like COVID period and there was some unusual uh, price hikes and those things, uh, how would it be handling it? Yeah, you can certainly look at that. As I say, anything you've got electronically, you can do that. It doesn't matter where it sits. And we found there was sometimes uh, where, I don't know whether you do that, where we had, uh, if you like, arrangements with the second line of defence. So they call this assurance mapping, you know. So we make sure we coordinate what we do with the other assurance providers like quality assurance and so on, the ISO team. And we can actually build in comparisons there as well. So, you know, the information that they're looking at, the information they're gathering, um, and also how does that actually show up in, within the systems themselves? So, yes, it's that's certainly quite feasible uh, to do that. As I say, the only thing you need to know is which system the information is on. Um, and, you know, essentially, as long as you've got one field that's the same, you can do the comparisons. So, as an example, I mentioned earlier, if you want to, you know, compare employees with suppliers, you just do on the name. But it could be a combination of the name, couldn't it? Or it could be a, a very similar name. It doesn't have to be exactly the same. So we found that was quite useful. Yes. So yeah, there's no, there is no restrictions on this, um, other than knowing the types of comparisons you'd want to do. So providing you've captured the information. Um, and you can actually get access to those systems on a read-only basis, there's nothing to stop you doing those comparisons. Um, and as I say, the only thing you need to do is find out what are we trying to gain from this and what comparisons do we do? So yes, it, you're, not, you're not restricted to, you know, a certain number of systems or activities, anything you want. Um, we used to look at this, for example, in the um, bidding process. So, you know, you can make sure that uh, uh, we one, we have received the, the appropriate number of bids for it. Uh, how do we uh, have we assessed them? What mechanisms have we used and so on? We even said there was this there was a system to assess it, which was a, a, a an automated system. So we could actually use that and say, why in this particular case or these five situations have we not given the uh, the work to the person who's got the highest score? you know, from our bidding process. Why haven't we done that? What's the reason? So again, it, it's a sort of, there isn't really anything that you can't compare, providing you've captured electronically. Okay, any other questions? As I said, I did get, I did get a number of questions sent earlier, and I think I've tried to, cover as many as I can uh, within that, but it, are there any of those aspects where you, you know, you you would want, you want me to go a little bit in more depth for you? Because obviously I've just given you a brief <laughs> overview of that. Any questions? Yes, if, if you have any questions, you can unmute your mic and ask. Yeah. I think there are some questions in the chat box. If you want to have a look in the chat box. OK, I unfortunately I haven't got access to the chat box, but uh, if you need to tell me what the arc is, if you will. Uh, yes, I will. I will read it out for you. Uh, for some reason, asking, not, and teams for me, it doesn't work okay. very well. Teams for me, but I can't get the chat box. OK, I will. I will read it out. If we need to do an audit on the construction project, what kind of audit do you suggest? Traditional or continuous? I think it's probably going to be a combination of the two, really. I think it's a sort of it depends which aspect of the construction project you're looking at. If you if you're involved right at the start, you know, in, and before we even decide on the on the contract, then I was suggesting that you should be involved in that stage as well. So you almost become like the strategic advisor. Um, but we used to look at issues there to say, how do we make sure that the board or the top management team have got all the information available? before they make the decision. So again, you know, looking at previous contracts, we could do a comparison using these tools and say, OK, um, we've done this this type of contract 12 times. It hasn't been successful in any one of those occasions. 
and it's always failed in this particular area. Um, what information have we actually captured to to make sure we ask those questions this time? So yes, you can you can certainly use the continuous process. We used to find in construction projects, we tr we tried to audit it during the currency of the project as well. So we could come into key stages to make sure nothing is missed before we go to the next stage. And all that information is 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 gathered, and then we allowed us to do this comparison as the progress was was occurring to be able to see where are we are we on track. Um, if it has been highlighted, this con this contract is going to overrun in terms of uh, cost. When was that identified? You know, why was that not highlighted to the program management team as soon as we knew? Oh well, we thought we could manage it again. That so we can identify those issues. So yes, it's a sort of. Uh, I think it's very very powerful in in things like construction projects. Yes. Okay, and um, kindly um, if we need. Okay, it's fine. Audit departments utilize data analytics using the field work only usually. What might be the practice to introduce data analytics in planning and reporting? Yeah, it's an interesting one because you're right. It is mainly used in the in the field work techniques. Um, but yes, very much the IA is now suggesting why not actually uh, adopt these techniques when we are actually planning and deciding what to do. We've got the most difficult thing for audit is determine your priorities. Do we do this audit or this audit or this audit? Really analyzing the changes within those activities is a very powerful one as well. So yes, they're suggesting very much we should you know, bring all these statistics together, which will tell us um, within this particular area, yes, we've got a new activities, we've got new requirements, we've got new regulations and so on. So the more of those there are, the more likely we want to do the audit. So as you know, if, if you've done the same audit last time, nothing's changed, then maybe we don't need to do this as quickly. We've not had any indicators of any issues. You can maybe wish to sort of analyze um, the variances from budget. That's another very good way of looking at it. So why let's pick the activities where they've got a greater variance from budget. So that's all that information is available. So you can do the analytics there. So yes, you can certainly do this before we. <coughs> and uh, one question is, what are the other analytical tools other than ACL? Uh, can we use anything else for correlation and standard deviation? <coughs> any, any other tool if you can name about it? There are there's quite a wide variety of tools out there. <clears throat> the two big ones are ACL and IDEA. ACL seems to be used mainly in the private sector and IDEA quite often in the public sector, but there's quite a lot of others uh, underneath there now which are equally um, equally there. I, I can just give you a list of the the main products if you'd like to, but I've not, uh, not actually <laughs> got that with me at the moment. But yeah, there's probably a dozen possible tools now. Is continuous audit approach sufficient for conducting technical audits or historical audit approach should continue in parallel? I think it, it depends what you mean by technical audit, I think. Uh, Ahmad Ali Mufti, if you can unmute yourself and ask the question and um, what exactly you're asking about. Just, I'm just not sure what you mean by technical audit. OK, um, maybe from the functional department or OK. OK, we will jump to the next one. What is the um, main advantage of a risk based audit? Well, risk based audit is, is auditing on the basis of the you're looking at the give the attention to the biggest risk. That's really what that is. It's the only real uh, process that's allowed by the Institute of Internal Auditors now. You know, you have to have a risk based approach. That means the focus is going to be if you miss things, miss the minor issues, don't miss the big ones. So in other words, audit on the basis of how significant the risk is to the organization um, and uh, making sure that the focus is given to the the, the areas of the highest risk. That's really what that is. Could, okay. I, could I ask a quick question on um, just stakeholder engagement? So I'm working Please, at the moment with, an in, with a company where we're not necessarily data rich, so, you know, data needs to be improved. So that's always going to cause us problems to have this sort right. of um, audit technology, Indeed. you know, kind of techniques to be applied. But yeah. the other thing is, is stakeholders, I suppose they're just not used to continuous auditing or 
audit analytics being done in this way through the third line. So there's there's not much buy-in to have mm. the data. I, I'm not going to say the data is not available. It is, but it's they're not forthcoming with the data. No. So no. what? What tips would you suggest to, to increase the buy-in by management so that they can see the value that we can add? Uh, you know, yeah. me presenting a dashboard full of stats is not really going to help. So from your experience, how can I get that buy-in from management? I think it is a really important one. And yeah, and I must admit when we were using it, <coughs> the, the, the these tools in the, in the past, you had to go almost to IT cap in hand and say, oh no, can we have access to this? Well, that isn't happening now. They're basically saying, you know, yes, you will have access to all of the, the systems and all you do, you take a copy of it, put your uh, put it on your own machine, and then you've got two systems, then you, then you can do the comparison. So you're not taking any risk with the data. Um, but I think you're right. What you've got to do is sell it. You've got to actually explain to people, what are we going to get from it? And I think the best way to do it with senior management is, is to say, you know, uh, when something goes wrong and we've done the audit, you come and blame us because you go, why didn't you spot that? And we said, well, we can only look at small numbers of transactions. We're only here for a short time. But if in this way we can actually look at the whole population and we can look at things in a lot more depth, then we can give you a lot more comfort, a lot more reassurance. Um, and uh, we, we're going to actually use our time much more wisely. And we'll be able to identify errors that we can then share with you that you can then put in as as control aspect. So what we're trying to do, and all you need is a few wins on this, a few of those where you go along and they say, oh my gosh, yes. And then they put in that and they say, now you see what's happened. Now we've actually managed that. We've dealt with that. I think it's like anything. You need some wins. You need some situations where people say, oh yeah, that was really good. One one way we used to use, and it's being used now very much more, is trying to identify areas of opportunity as well as risk. So we know to flip it over so we can identify areas which are over-managed, over-controlled, over-engineered. And you can do that with these tools and go, hang on, why, why do we actually have these five levels in this when really, you know, there doesn't appear to be anybody doing any checking of any of them. It's just signatures on a piece of paper, you know, or they say they've checked it. Why are they doing that? So I think this type of stuff where we can maybe analyze the complexity and going, really, does it need to be that complex? Sometimes that's really good. So I think there's a number of number of ways you can engage people. To try and understand what would be beneficial to the organization. But yeah. I think that there's a very key line there. We don't want them to rely on just us. And I think your Not point at all. Is Not the at all. first line is really important. I know the company that I work for, the second line is not strong. So one right. of the things I don't want to make is a, a control environment where they're just reliant on internal audit. Which Definitely is not. not. What no, no, no. Obviously, so no, I, I would, yeah, I think you're right there. I think what you've got to do is obviously what you can do is is actually you know um, engage the second line of defence as well within this. So you know creating this assurance mapping process, which also incorporates the continuous audit process. So we you know essentially involve the second line of defence and bring them up to speed. There, because as you're right, you don't want to be seen to be the the ones that are relying on totally for assurance. That's clearly not what you'd want. So. Yeah, I was I was assuming the second line defense would be strong, but okay, that's so yes, yeah, so maybe that's there's there's more work to do on that one. Yeah. Okay, we have some four or five questions. I will read them quickly. Uh, where should ID auditors placed uh, IT department or the audit department? And can we use the data analytics to protect future patterns? Uh, the IT auditor should definitely be within the audit team. Yeah, I mean, obviously you, you want those separately from that. I think sometimes it, the IT auditors can be the bridge between the business and IT because neither really understand each other. And we found that our IT auditors were very, very useful in that, in providing that linkage between the two. Um, and I think, what was the second part of the question there? Because I didn't get the second it part. Is, can we use the data analytics to protect future patterns? Um, yeah, I think you can. I think it's we are trying to anticipate going forward. Now, audit is very much trying to anticipate what's happening, what's 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 happening moving forward. So I think, yes, you can potentially put some of those 
comparisons in. The trouble is you've got to have the data. That's the only trouble with with this. If you don't have the data yet, then obviously it's a bit more difficult to do. But I think, yes, it's we are trying to future proof, definitely. So the logic on here to say, look, the reason we're highlighting this is because this is going to become a bigger issue, a bigger risk going forward. Therefore, we need to step in now. So, yes, you can. OK, uh, what risk we can expect in the owner based business with less staff, but no proper controls. So maybe um, in the uh, maybe it's a small setup they're asking in the owner based business where it's a less staff, but and, and we have no proper control. So what what could be the expected risk in that case? Well, I think, you know, in those who would let us staff, this is where data analysis comes into its own, really, because, you know, you can't necessarily go and audit in, in depth uh, because you don't have the people to do it. But if you're able to analyze the data, you can actually get a lot more out of it. Yes, you still need to go to go into that. We used to use this also, and th these issues we talk about in the forthcoming courses, how do you actually determine the priorities for audit? And that very much is a risk-based approach now, but equally you can look at it and say, do we have these analytic tools and what, what we'll be able to do in those where, where maybe the, otherwise there'd be a lot of resources required, which we don't have. So analytics sometimes enable you to, to do audits in a lot more depth than you can with le with less people. So it is possible to do that. Yeah, and I think, okay. you know, sometimes owner managed businesses are more difficult because you've got to convince the owner about these issues rather than just so. And, and we found, you know, going along with some wins and explaining these issues. Example, what we okay. used to do is we used to be involved in terms of um, making sure that key decisions didn't have to be um, changed and we went along and say how do you make how do you know you've got all the information available and how do you know people aren't deliberately understating the risk to get their proposal through and they said we don't know that we just assumed it's correct I said well this is the analyst we've done here which actually demonstrates that this is not in accordance with the way we've assessed the risk all right so all we did was compare the proposal the risk assessment with the risk assessment that's done in the risk registers so again I developed this a lot more in terms of the uh, the advanced risk based audit course so please come along to that one if you if you if you need to know more about that we have last uh, two questions we already have five minutes over time um, one is in using historical data audits the data is usually fully matured and is available that is not the case with the most live data audit so how do you recommend going about that you are right on that one. Certainly, you've got to be a little more careful. But the comparisons you're trying to do are only indicators. You know, you're just trying to identify aspects. And it, it may well be that as a result of that, you actually are able to spot, you know, issues with the live data as well. So in other words, doing as I mentioned, comparing inputs and outputs and looking at the comparison afterwards, sometimes when it identifies an anomaly, there's some issue with the live data, you know, which maybe need to be more work. So actually it helps you to develop uh, the mechanisms and, and also increasingly ensures that live data is more accurate. So yes, it, there's a win-win situation as I think. Okay, and the last question is, um, kindly explain the Benford's law of first digit occurrence and uh, what about the implication? So maybe yeah. we can... You shared some light. Uh, Benford's, I did ben mention briefly. Probably the best thing on Benford's is there's quite a lot of information on that on the internet or whatever. I would suggest you go and have a look at that. There, there, it's it seems very complex, but it isn't really. It's just about how numbers occur. It's the pattern in the numbers. So, and it's this huge amount of uses for it. Um, Any time where you've got uh, data information which is randomly generated, potentially. So that could be sales, invoices, purchases, I mean, you name it, um, you can do the comparisons and we'll highlight that. So it's we, that's another topic we go into a lot more depth in terms of the training courses. So uh, Benford's Law is, uh, because most people don't, have never even heard of it. So, <laughs> so and see, if you've seen a manager, they wonder what you're talking about. But if you show them what you've done with it, then you'll get a very different reaction. Okay, um, thank you so much, Phil, and uh, thank you for all, all the participants. Uh, Phil, if you can stop sharing your video. Uh, meantime, I will just say a goodbye note to all. Uh, thank you all. Uh, and we will send you the video recording and along with the slides and along with the feedback link. So feedback is really important for us to plan the sessions going forward. 
And as Phil indicated uh, during the session, we have upcoming programs of advanced risk-based audit, future of internal audit, and audit essentials, for which my team will be contacted you people um, after the session. So if we can have, if we can open our camera, say a goodbye, I will take a quick uh, photo, uh, screenshot, and, and then thank you, Nassar. Um, thank you, Tahra. It, it's great to see people whom we are connected since last one hour. Okay. Thank thanks, you, everybody. Away, Asim. Thanks a lot. Glad you were able to come along, everybody. I hope I've given you a few we ideas. Have people talk from five different countries. We have people from India, Pakistan, UAE, Oman, Bahrain, Saudi, uh, and some other other regions as well. So it uh, it's it's a very interactive and mixed gathering. Thank you, Gopal, and Oman. All all, all all of which I have visited. I think oh, I've now okay. visited. I think I've now Bangladesh. visited 130 countries, I think. So I've, oh. <laughs> so I've, I've been to, I think, all of your countries. Great. Thank you, Shainara. Uh, you have opened the camera, but it's blank. OK, thank you so much. I'm just taking a screenshot now. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Hope to see you again in the future. Um, Mr. Mr. Phil? Yeah. Marwan is here. Yeah. Uh, can we get a copy of, of this recording so that we can see it later on? Yes, that's going to be sent to you. Yes. Yes. So yes. we will receive will, an email we'll shortly. With this. Yeah, you will receive an email. Uh, it will take some time for you to download and then upload on our channel. So you will receive an email maybe today, end of the day, or maybe tomorrow early morning. Great. Thank you for this. I, and he, he can pass them on to me if there's any further questions you need to ask afterwards. OK, OK, definitely, definitely. Yeah, thank you so very uh, much, everybody. Thank you. Hope to see you at the uh, either the course next week on future internal audit or the uh, advanced risk based audit in July. Also, we do an enterprise risk management course in July as well. So if you'd like to be interested in that one, then obviously Keza will be able to happy to give you all the information. Thanks very much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Phil. Thank you. Welcome. Bye. <laughs>